question that we now have to ask is, what is a gene? And so we're going to start talking about some very basic biology, but it's important to understand a fairly complex set of traits that make up aniridia. And so we'll start with the basics. All genes are made up of DNA. They have four letters. The code is A, G, C, and T. And if you look at the schematic in the middle, so there's a spiral diagram of uh, a double helix on the left-hand side of your diagram. There's a flat diagram in the middle, and then there's a space modeling diagram on the far right. What we can see is that A, excuse me, A and T always pair together. G and C always pair together. And so DNA is made up of two strands that have four letters, and the letters have to be arranged in a certain way. You can think of DNA as an information storage system. In many respects, it's like a library or a set of blueprints. And so all of the information that makes each one of us who we are is stored in uh, these strands of DNA. But as a storage mechanism, and so as a storage mechanism, it's great, but it can't do uh, all of the work that needs to be done in the cell. Before, we, before I tell you how information is transferred from the DNA to the cell, I need to remind you that all of the cells in the body have the same genomic DNA, with a couple exceptions. And so the only cells that don't have the same DNA are those in the immune system. But beyond that, all skin, all organ systems, the brain, the eyes, every single cell in the body has the same genomic DNA, and that's important. In a cell that needs to use a gene, the information stored in the DNA is going to be transcribed into a structure that we call messenger RNA. A messenger RNA is sim simply a single transient copy of information that was originally stored in the DNA, but it's now in a form that the cells can use. And so to put it in the context of uh, gene expression, we say that the gene is expressed. What you're looking at is a, an E10 and a half or a mid gestation mouse embryo that has been labeled to show PAC6 message in the cells of the animal that are expressing it. So if we start at the upper left hand corner by the, the A, you'll see that there are two areas labeled, one with CV and one with DI. The purple stain that you see there represents cell, or actually cells that are expressing PAC6 in the mouse. The CV and DI are going to together make up the forebrain. E is denoting where the I is, and if you look in the middle, you'll see expression in the, so the outer part of that is expressed in the retina, and the inner part that I just marked is the developing lens. In addition to the developing forebrain and I, PAC6 is expressed in the nose, which I just labeled, in the developing hindbrain, in the spinal cord, and also in the endocrine pancreas. So the important thing for PAC6 and other genes like PAC6 is that the cells that express this gene are the same cells that require it. So you can already see that in addition to being used for eye development, PAC6 is used for the developing forebrain, the developing nose, developing hindbrain, spinal cord, or altogether, that part of the central nervous system, as well as the endocrine pancreas. If we actually look at the message for PAC6, and so this is just a part of it, what you can see starting in the upper left-hand corner is literally the start of the PAC6 message, and it starts with the C-A-G, A-G-G. PAC6 is like all other genes, are divided up into exons and introns. We will get back to what an exon and an intron is at the moment, or later, but for now, exons are put together to make messenger RNA. For PAC6, the first start of the protein is located down in exon 4, and that's denoted by the letter M, and I just put a little arrow by it. 
So all of the exonic sequence that comes before that is called untranslated sequence, but you can think of it as a leader sequence. What you're not seeing is the rest of the gene, which would continue on from exon 5. The other point that I want to make with this slide is that the code, there's a code in the message that the cells can read, and it converts the message that came from the DNA into a protein sequence. And so in this case, the protein sequence begins with the letter M, it goes to the letter Q, N, S, and so forth. The conversion of the message to protein is called translation. So the information in the messenger RNA is used to guide the assembly of the protein, shown here as a blue circle, and it is the proteins that do all of the work in the cell. So it's not enough to have a gene expressed. The gene also must be converted into protein in order to have an effect. The genetic code, again, has a letter alphabet of A, G, C, and T. These letters, these four letters, are going to be arranged to contain information that make up proteins. And one of the, there are a couple of very important triplets, ATG, which we've just seen, which encodes for the amino acid methionine, and that often represents the start. And words like tag or some others that mean stop. All in whole, there are about 20 amino acids that we can use that can be used to make up proteins, and they all have their own alphabet. So if we look again at the PAC6 sequence, we now see that the ATG is broken out, and so that first triplet means that it tells the cell that this is where the PAC6 protein begins, and it will continue to read until it finds a stop codon. Another way to find look at the PAC6 six protein is this way. And so you're looking at the entire 422 amino acid sequence code for PAC6. That M that we saw a moment ago is, of course, the first M, which is in the upper left-hand corner. I've divided the protein into different colors to represent different functional parts of the protein, which we'll see in a moment. The section marked in red binds to DNA, one type of DNA. The section marked in blue binds to a slightly different type of uh, sequence in DNA. And the section marked in green is the part that helps other proteins um, bind to the DNA and turn other genes on or off. So PAC6 is a transcription factor. And so what that means is that the PAC6 protein, in fact, binds the DNA. And so in this set of cartoons, on the left-hand side, we have a schematic showing the double helix of DNA. And then the circular domains marked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 represent the parts of the PAC6 protein that physically bind to DNA and allow it to turn genes on or off. On the right-hand side, we just have a simple, a different model, but showing the same thing. So the blue strands are the double helix, and the red represents the PAC6 protein bound to the DNA. PAC6 is a transcription factor, and so PAC6 is going to be responsible for turning genes on or off as necessary to make an eye. And so to summarize this part of the talk, genes are made up of DNA. But not all of the DNA, in fact, very little of the DNA in our bodies is used actually to make genes. The same genes are in all cells, and so cells that need to use PAC6 or other types of uh, transcription factors need to turn the genes on. A cell does this by transcribing the gene into a message, and so a gene that is on will be transcribed into a message that we can see in the embryo, just like the PAC6, um, the PAC6 stain in the mouse embryo that I showed you a minute ago. Importantly, the information in the message is then used to guide the assembly of the protein that is coded by the gene, and it's the protein that actually carries out the work in the cell. And so if one has a mutation in the PAC6 transcript or in the gene, then the protein may not be made, and so it's as if the gene was never turned on in the first place. So the next thing that we need to know about PAC6 
is that one a mutation in one copy of PAC6 will cause aniridia, and that's shown over here on the right. In order to get normal eye development, you have to have two good copies of the gene. One copy of the gene is going to come from mom, and the other copy is going to come from dad. So, in technical language, we say that a heterozygous loss of function mutation, in other words, the PAC6 gene can no longer make a functional protein, causes both aniridia in humans and the small eye trait in mice. And the reason I need to show the mice is because of the next slide. The small eye trait in a rodent is exactly the same as in a human, um, and so it is our mouse model or our animal model that allows us to study aniridia people. The next thing that you need to realize about PAC6 is that whereas a heterozygous loss of mutation uh, causes aniridia or small eye, so here's a normal, um, a normal mouse embryo with a normal eye, here is a small eye animal, and you can see these animals are the, these animals are the same. So the animal on the left and the right are litter mates, and you can see that the eye and the, the animal in the middle is smaller than the animal on the left. If an animal has no, cop, no functional copies of PAC6, which is denoted by the rightmost panel, the eye fails to develop entirely. The forebrain develops abnormally, and so and the nose fails to form, and so these animals uh, die either in utero or shortly after birth, um, either due to brain defects or because they suffocate. So a homozygous mutation, in other words, two mutant copies of PAC6, is lethal. So. Now we need to ask what type of PAC6 mutations cause eye defects. Before I move on, are there any questions? Jim, the picture you showed a couple slides earlier of the child had looked like they had two different size iris. Yes, Is that, that's correct. That's the first time I think I've seen that. Um, this is an unusual case of aniridia, but it's not atypical. So um, one of the things about PAC6 is, uh, one of the things about aniridia and PAC6 mutations is that the eye phenotype can range from almost completely normal looking iris to uh, an iris presentation like what you see here in this child to a complete absence of iris. This child is also unusual because the, the irises are asymmetric. So this is somewhat unusual, but it's often um, a useful slide for me to show. Okay, thank you. 